Pick, Assistant Secretary. Here. And with that, we do have five officers present. Okay, thank you. Um, it's been a historic time, times two or more uh, here in uh, across the United States and in the Northwest. So um, I know that uh, uh, I was just thinking through the um, challenges that we face and uh, um, this latest activity with um, the George Floyd um, protests and all of the um, institutional racism is um, finally getting some traction. And it's something that we, of course, have, <laughs> you know, we see every day. It was probably the main reason most of us got up this morning, got on this call. And uh, so one of the primary reasons is protecting our sovereignty, which is a constitutional right that seems to be ignored, which in its nature is is inherently racist. So um, I just feel good to be here with all of you. It's been tough for us. We've, you know, we had the uh, um, police shooting here at, in Paulsville, July 3rd, and it's coming up on the anniversary of that. And still feel like there's really been no real um, um, justice for that. And this has brought it up again. And, uh, you know, I was on a call with some elected leaders from around the county and um, it was hard because uh, we had a peaceful protest up in Paulsville. It was so peaceful that they wouldn't even jaywalk because it was at the intersection of the highway there. And uh, so it was just great, mostly young people. And uh, then I went downtown and there were these uh, paramilitary um, folks walking around with AR-15s, military assault rifles, walking in through downtown Pulsebo, you know. And uh, it was just such a contrast. They were going to protect the town from rioting or polluting or something. Well, nobody even went down there. So anyway, it was... Um, it was troubling for me. So anyway, I've been going through a little of that. Um, and uh, I know all of us are going through a lot of this at home. So I didn't want to take up too much time with that. But I felt it needed to be acknowledged um, that we know that all of this uh, is hard for us as leaders, because our people really, um, you know, need to be protected and look to us to do that. So I just wanted to say that uh, hopefully, um, you're all uh, managing your best you can. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, turn things over to Terry to get us into our agenda. Terry? Let's see here. Okay, now, now can you? Yeah, you're good. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to make some announcements. Um, one is uh, over the weekend, the Spokane tribe held their uh, ca tribal council elections and Carol Evans uh, was the only one on their ballot. However, uh, she ran unopposed, so she is once again, uh, she is back on. At Coeur d'Alene, um, uh, Ernie Stensgar was up and he uh, was reelected. Unfortunately, Christopher Luke was not reelected and he was, uh, Carol Dean Swan is the new, um, uh, council person at Coeur d'Alene. Uh, Chief Allen will be the chairman there. Um, Donnie Szynski is the vice and uh, Hemi James is the secretary treasurer. But I just wanted to share that with everybody. And then um, uh, we had scheduled the um, uh, at and I virtual conference for the third week in uh, uh, June. We have moved that back. Uh, we had we just with our contracting trying to uh, get uh, someone to do this for us uh, the virtual part of it um, so we moved it back to june 30th july 1st and 2nd and we'll get um, information out on that quickly as well but right now laura uh, uh, Today, Brian Gunn was unable to be with us. Um, I think he's taken some time off. And um, with us this morning, starting this off this morning, will be Laura Platero from the Health Board. Laura? Thank you. And I did send, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I did send uh, you and James my slides. Is James on and can he pull them up? James, um, 
Are you able to pull this up for me? Yeah, I'm bringing it up now. I just okay. saw the email come in. Okay, thank you. Thank you for pulling them up for me. So um, I just wanted to give you our weekly update that we provide um, usually on our 10 a.m. call. And so we collect this uh, data from 36 uh, IHS tribal and urban Indian facilities. And you'll see here 27 are tribal programs, six are IHS and three are urban. And Right now, uh, we have in our area 456 positive cases, and this number has gone up. And so I want to jump into the next slide. Next, please. So uh, you'll see in this slide that the numbers have gone up. Um, they're going up much faster than they had before. So you'll see in the far right, we have 84 new cases since May 30th, so in about a week. Uh, Oregon has 11 new cases and Idaho has 14 new cases. Uh, you know, it, we do think it's uh, the increases, you know, related to hotspots, increased testing, but it is definitely something to, of concern um, in terms of, just in terms of just seeing them going up so quickly. And so I, th you know, the only, way to stop it as I think most of you and probably everyone knows is to contact trace that's really really key and at the board we do have resources to assist you um, and your staff uh, with any contact tracing needs um, Johns Hopkins also has this free online training it's a six hour training it's done really really well and we do trainings too let me say that but Johns Hopkins also has something that uh, your staff uh, could access and learn how to do that. But really, I just can't emphasize that enough that that's one way to keep the virus contained. Uh, and if there's anything that we can do or provide resource to you, we do have a lot of people trained in contact tracing. And uh, we also are getting some CDC foundation employees that are specifically available to tribes for that purpose. Um, and so, you know, just again, just seeing the numbers go up, uh, just want to make sure we can stay on top of it as much as possible. And okay, going on to one more slide. Does anyone have any questions? I'm sorry about that slide first or I move on. Um, and then um, we do have uh, two more people have passed since um, I last reported to you. So now there's a total of 12 people have passed from Washington tribes um, and there's 13 total one we did get from anecdotal data someone reported to us uh, but not through the IHS system so we're trying to keep track of that also um, so yes yeah, it's so, so again anything we can do in this regard um, what I see is that's not in the slide set that I thought was in here and I just want to mention it is we do also track tribe supply of uh, PPE and last week I had reported that 10 slide 10 tribes were down to an inadequate level and so we're trying to really stay on top of that and one um, I did get a call last Friday and um, about from Amazon business apparently Amazon the Amazon we all use to buy things they have a tribal liaison person who's working for them now handling all of their Amazon business accounts um, for tribes. And so they are signing up tribes for free and providing um, PPE at cost. And it includes a full range of PPE, including hand sanitizer, cleaning products. And um, the only thing they have to do is uh, your, the CFO for the tribe has to contact them and just set it up and you get a license. And it's just access to, it's Amazon, but Amazon business with this additional level of access to PPE at cost. And so um, I'm happy to, if you like that information, I'm happy to share it with you. I can send it to um, Terry, or if any of you want to email me directly, uh, I'll put my email address in the chat box and I can connect you with uh, the person that I spoke with. Uh, there's also just, I wanted to share,
prepare, there's new guidance, and I'll send this all to Terry. There's new guidance on masks, and not only for medical staff, but also non-medical staff, and the sort of uh, um, a mask that would basically protect employees even from um, infiltration of any virus. And there's basically, now they're saying that it's the mask should be three layers. This is what the WHO is saying. And it, it basically explains what, the, what it should be made of. So I, I will send that to Terry so that you all have that information. Um, and so that's new information. We've been hearing two, plot, two layers. Now we're hearing three layers from the WHO. So I think it's just important to know when and if uh, you're in the process of purchasing masks that um, the, the mask be three layers. Uh, let's see what else I have here. Um, there's also, um, I'm sorry, going back to contact tracing, uh, there's some tools that are available that um, I don't know how many of you are using any, any contact tracing tools. Um, there's like, software that can help you track contacts that maybe tribal members have been in touch with so that you can keep track of obviously who's been contacted. And um, uh, But these are more formal. I, what I'm hearing, I know from I chest facilities as they're doing it within the EHR system, which is more limited and it basically limits the contact tracing to only um, staff, medical staff who have access to the EHR system. So these software programs actually help you expand that to include other people to do contract tra tracing outside of the, the um, medical system. Um, I think those are the, those are the main things I wanted to um, to share with you and just let you know that we're here for, for you um, in terms of any of your needs. And I'm gonna put my cell phone number and email address in the chat box for any of you that are interested um, in you know, the Amazon business. And also, I'll send it to Terry too, but I can get it to you quickly right now. Um, or if you, if you need anything, um, I, I, we can also, I could do a brief, uh, like a very short, summary of what contact tracing is and how it works next week if you were interested in that. Um, and I could also do like a full range of all of the sort of opportunities um, or actually uh, TA and training that we offer at the board right now. Whatever would be most useful to you, I'm happy to start doing maybe some mini info sessions with you next week. Um, I'd like to follow up. Uh, uh, with something that Laura mentioned, and that is the uh, PPP, <clears throat> the access to uh, PPP. Um, we, as we've all heard, that there have been, you know, uh, inadequate supplies sent to tribes. Um, we know there are some scams out there. You know, uh, the cost goes up after you order and things like that. And so, in addition to uh, Amazon, the um, National Center for American Indian and in, uh, Economic Development, NCAIED. They are working with a consultant and um, they have developed a list who, uh, with a list of, of vendors who have been vetted through them. And so um, they're uh, confident that they're, they have a solid list. So uh, uh, we may have them on next week joining Laura as well. So just to let you know. But in the meantime, is there any questions for Laura? Always happy to have you join us, Laura. Um, thanks for uh, being here. And um, uh, as she does every week, she um, uh, encourages or, or invites everyone to get on their 10 o'clock call as well. Um, uh, with us today um, from NOAA, uh, with regards to the CARES Act fisheries assistance, uh, we have Kelly Dennett with us. Kelly is the Domestic Fisheries Division Chief, Division Chief out of the Office of Sustainable Fisheries. Uh, Kelly? Yes, hi. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for being with us, and uh, go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, so Terry had passed on the request to just provide an update on where things stand following uh, the call that we had last week. Uh, so right now, um, we are in the same place that we were uh, as of last Monday. Uh, we received input from approximately 20 tribes in response to our request for further guidance and input from the tribes on how to do our sub-allocation process of the CARES Act funds. 
And so we are in the process of going through that input um, and making some uh, decisions about how, how to move forward. Uh, so we expect that there will be an additional data call provided out to the tribes here in the near term to help us gather the information that we will then use to make those sub-allocation determinations. Once those sub-allocations are determined, each respective tribe will be responsible for developing their own spend plan. Uh, and that spend plan uh, will be where you will articulate what your criteria are, your eligibility, how you're going to determine the uh, either the 35% loss or uh, the negative impacts to ceremonial or subsistence fisheries. Uh, that will be where you document that. Uh, and then that will be submitted to uh, Pacific states to ensure that it has all of the relevant uh, paperwork, meets all of the grant conditions, and then submitted to NOAA Fisheries for approval. So that's where we stand in the general anticipated next steps, uh, Terry, and, and with that, I'd be happy to answer questions. Any questions for Kelly? Uh, it's Ron, uh, Jamestown. So, um, you know, I, I, we answered the questions. Uh, they were um, odd questions to answer, quite frankly. Um, you know, how do we, how do you, you're asking us to almost quantify ceremonial and subsistence fishery, which is a, an important agenda for the Northwest tribes, but um, it's a commercial um, uh, aspect that, that is the big ticket uh, in terms of all of our fishers who lost opportunity, can't fish, have no market. Um, I mean, you know, we certainly can go back over the years and, and see the, the impact um, of, the, of the fishery. But uh, going back five years, it kind of takes it out of context relative to this year, um, which is a unique year, as opposed to a year where we had problems with, where the fishery what didn't exist. Um, um, uh, you know, last year uh, uh, we, we had a, a um, Tariff, law, tariff restrictions with China, et cetera. But uh, it's an awkward way to go about trying to quantify um, the impact to um, our fishery industry. Sure, Ron, this is, uh, this is Kelly. Um, so appreciate that five years, uh, you know, is, is a time period to go back. Um, that, that's what's stipulated in the CARES Act. That's statutory requirement. Uh, so we have no flexibility there, um, and that is specific to the commercial aspects, um, and the negative impacts would be compared to that prior five-year average. So the CARES Act specifies that the 35% uh, economic revenue loss is based on a comparison of the time period in 2020 compared to the previous five-year average, and that's required in the Act. Okay, fair enough. I, I think more of it is, it's more, I got it. I, I, I read the app too. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's a fallback plan for the department. Um, I think the department needs to be active um, in communicating to Congress that for whatever reason, in their infinite wisdom, it was the wrong benchmark to use to determine the impact to our, our uh, fishers and in industry. So, uh, fair enough. We're gonna we'll, we'll deal with it as best we can, um, but uh, I did, we I think we got to keep making that statement to the to the department because um, they're just uh, they're, because they're uh, in my opinion they were being advised. We know how this system works, uh, where Congress is trying to make a decision on something that, that's uh, having an impact and trying to provide relief. They're going to go to the department for counsel, and quite frankly, I think that the council. Uh, uh, ill inform them. And that's just my speculation on how it works because I know the communication between the, the congressional staff and the administration. So um, I think that they, they need some, uh, uh, we need to have a follow up conversation when this is all um, done. Thank you, Ron. More than happy to pass that feedback on. This is, uh, this is Kat Brigham with the Umatilla Tribe, and I agree with Ron is that, you know, there's a number of mistakes that have been made in this 
but at the same time, we've got to live with it. But it's, it's uh, very, uh, I guess, disheartening in that uh, we're asked to do something and then we're going to go to the commission to seek approval. And sometimes we don't necessarily have the greatest relationship with that commission and then to NOAA. Uh, it seems to me like the process is, um, I guess, not best for tribes and that the tribes, uh, you know, have to do the documentation, which, you know, I think we can do, but at the same time, you know, ceremonial subsistence is the first priority and, you know, then commercial. But at the same time, we've always been afraid to put dollar amounts on our treaty fishing rights because a very long time ago, and still sometimes people will say, oh, we can buy you out. So that's a major concern. And I think it's really important that, you know, there be a fair allocation amongst all the tribes and Quite frankly, uh, $5.1 million set aside for 24 tree fishing tribes is not necessarily a fair allocation. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that feedback. Certainly appreciate that uh, the ceremonial and subsistence is, is not quantifiable, um, which is why we were seeking input from all of the tribes on whether other metrics um, would be more appropriate to use as part of the suballocation um, other than, than, than trying to quantify it in some way. Um, so certainly appreciate and recognize uh, the cultural value that you place uh, on those fisheries. And also wholeheartedly agree that 5.1 million is not enough. 300 million was not enough uh, for across all of those sectors that are tens of billions of dollars of revenue, uh, 300 million is, is not going to go a very long way for anyone. Um, and we certainly understand that. So thank you for that feedback. Yeah, Leonard here. Um, so just from my understanding, I'm sure everybody probably also understands, but you, you're going to do, you're going to determine how much each tribe gets and then we submit a spending plan and then we get compensated. Is that the, that's the plan? Correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Kelly? Well, just as long as Jamestown gets as much as Yakima. <laughs> well, you have to, I think Yakima's got a different exchange rate than Jamestown. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to take my video back down. <laughs> I definitely wish I was on the Zoom part of this call to see to see your reactions right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, is anything else out there? Okay, thank you for coming on. We appreciate your um, um, information. Absolutely, thank you for your time and the offer. And if you have any further follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Great. Thanks, yeah. Kelly. Bye. Okay, um, next up we have uh, uh, Joel. Joel's uh, going to be talking about, um, if you can look in the chat box, that's what he's going to be talking about this, what came out of uh, EPA recently. So, Joel? Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, it's good to be with you. Uh, good to see some of your faces and, and, uh, and hear about uh, how our individual tribes are dealing with these difficult times, protecting our tribal members and our, our, uh, our environments. Um, so speaking of that, um, you know, amid all of this um, chaos, uh, you know, the, the federal government has not, is still laser focused. The Trump administration is still not slowing down on, on rollbacks of protections of our environment. And so I just have a couple updates um, of uh, uh, regulations and EPA rules that, that require some attention here in the next um, 30 to 60 days. Uh, so the first one is last week, uh, EPA, uh, 
released a finalized rule uh, related to the Clean Water Act, um, Section 401. And all, all, all of these um, regulations and um, that are being proposed uh, make it easier for industry uh, business to push through big projects and limit tribes and states, their abilities to um, uh, reduce or eliminate pollution and harm caused by those projects. So this is another one in a long line of proposed regulations. I think we're close to 100 now from the Trump administration. Um, they're, being, they're being pushed back at, at every stage, um, comment period stage, and then eventually a lot of them wind up in court as well. Um, but this particular one um, puts a couple restrictions on the, the tribes and states um, to, to, uh, to put forward their concerns. Um, so they, they limit it, uh, they, they um, take away the ability for tribes to comment on the air quality and the transportation concerns of these projects, which have been big um, on the comments that ATI and ATI member tribes have made on prior projects. Um, they also, this one also um, uh, requires that tribes and states um, submit those comments um, a lot faster. So we have less time to, to, um, to do the research and formulate these comments on how they're going to impact negatively our, our uh, natural resources. So before it was a year and now Army Corps and, and others, they can, they can um, require us to submit it less than a year. Um, so we have 60 days. Um, so now, um, uh, so it was last week. So we have 53 days um, to comment. And so this issue will be on our ATI and uh, Natural Resources Committee when we do our virtual convention in a couple weeks. And we'll most likely have a resolution um, from, uh, to address this. Uh, the second one that I wanted to talk about is uh, the Waters of the U.S. rule. I know that a lot of folks on this call um, uh, are familiar with it. Um, the uh, the final rule became, uh, or sorry, was uh, will become effective on June twenty second um, this month. So uh, pretty close um, to that and. We, you know, tribes in AT&I, we've, we've submitted resolutions and comments on this, um, but we, we have just recently um, been contacted by uh, Earth Justice. And so they're wondering if any tribes are considering filing a lawsuit on this. So if, uh, if you have your own contacts with them, please reach out. Um, respond to that request. If not, contact me and I will put you um, uh, in, in contact with, with uh, Earth Justice. Um, EPA and Army are conducting some webinars this month and next month on how, um, how that final rule on the, the waters of the U.S. Um, will affect us. Um, third one is um, just a couple days ago, on June 4th, um, uh, the pre uh, president uh, issued an executive order uh, ex uh, basically expediting a lot of these infrastructure projects that Departments of Transportation and Army, Interior, Defense um, have been working on. And uh, I think this is a, an effort to, to um, boost the economy, but also it's an effort to uh, skirt and get around uh, NEPA and other environmental laws. So that was just released. Um, and uh, yeah, it's like, you know, uh, taking advantage of the crisis and the, and that we're currently in, unfortunately. So we'll, we'll, be, we'll be addressing um, that as well during our 18i virtual convention under natural resources. So that's it for now, but um, take any questions, comments. Joel, Tom Wooten here. Do you know if uh, the AGs uh, queued up a, a case for the state of Washington? Thank you. 
Thanks, Chairman. Uh, I don't know that. I, I put in a request uh, to to their office. You know, uh, we have a, a new tribal liaison, Asa Washines, so he's looking into it. Um, no word yet on whether whoa, they'll whoa, file a whoa, lawsuit. Whoa. But wait, wait a minute, Joel. Yeah. What was it? Asa's where? He's he's the new tribal liaison for Washington AG. That's for awesome. Bob Ferguson. You didn't yeah. get the memo? No, I was <laughs> expecting to get uh, get an opportunity to. Um, I veto or approve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's exciting. I've been waiting to uh, receive uh, the press release. My understanding is a press release will go out today, but uh, he did uh, uh, jump on board last week. So um, we'll get that out if I, if I get it today, if I can access it today. Any other? Couldn't let that slide by there. Wow. That's awesome. Um, so I think that the AG's on top of this latest one um, about the Clean Water Act. Well, I understand there's several AG's that are jumping on this one. Um, I just got an email from our uh, uh, DC firm about it. And um, it's been kind of quiet, Joel. Um, I don't know why. I think it's probably because of all of the activity that we've been having um, around the pandemic and the um, civil unrest. So it's, uh, but I was really pretty shocked by it. I don't know if you know of how, I think one of the things that is difficult sometimes for us is that it's fairly complex and, you know, we all review permits and our technical staff review permits and just trying to figure out how, you know, with all these things, you have to pick your battles. And um, I'm just wondering if you're familiar with any projects that, have been, um, you know, scrutinized under this um, type of uh, um, legislation that they're trying to reverse or eliminate. Well, yeah, um, the one that comes to mind right now, the biggie is uh, the, the Jordan Cove, the liquefied natural gas um, proposed big project down there on Coos, Lower Umpqua and Sayusla land. Um, and, you know, and it affects multiple tribes in Oregon and California with the pipeline. So um, the state of Oregon used uh, Section 401 of the Clean Water Act to, um, to deny that permit. And so this, this would directly impact that project. That's a biggie, but there's so many others, too, here in the Northwest. Okay, I got... Yeah, um, this is Taylor. Uh, the, the, the Millennium, too, I think, is, is another example of the coal terminal. You know, that, that zombie project that just doesn't seem to go away. Um, so I was good. I was, I have a couple of resolutions drafted, Joel, that I'll get to you with. Uh, one is an overall, maybe an overall re, um, condemnation of, of the Trump administration's environmental um, rollbacks, you know, kind of uh, an overall general statement of, of uh, disappointment from the tribes um, on on that so something like that we might be able to tie it into this new EPA one, but I know we've done several uh, you know resolutions on specific uh, policy but maybe a, a, a bigger general one um, too so maybe we do two on that um, and then just a heads up uh, especially for Columbia uh, Basin tribes is that there is uh, some permitting that's going on there in Portland. Uh, I, I can't uh, remember the name of the project uh, specifically, but they're looking to move oil uh, down to an existing terminal down in Portland um, and uh, railroad it uh, there and then uh, out to Columbia via ships. So that's there's some permitting going on in Portland on that. Uh, we have a resolution, uh, more specifics. So I'll get that to you, Joel, but it's... Uh, you know, uh, more issues. So I, I have got a quick, uh, uh, different question, Joel. Uh, is there any new news on uh, the proposed climate change summit this fall? Uh, the last I heard from, from Don was that it is um, canceled for this year. I don't think, uh, but uh, Terry, do you have an update on, on, on that? No, all I know is that um, that that's the direction they were going to go. Um, I'm no, so I don't know any anything further other than that. 
So you're more, understanding more, is, more, more specific. I'm sorry. I was going to say more specifically to uh, postpone to next year. So that we still want, we're still going to have it, but yeah. Okay. Okay, any other questions for Joel? I have one question. I noticed in the chat box that Leonard put in there about uh, provides tribes and states with the authority to deny permits, et cetera, and denials based on air quality or transportation concerns, public access to waters. Now, this might be a dumb question, but now we've already done Cherry Point and some of the um, Columbia River issues by ATNI resolution. So is this going backwards? Or are those uh, denials then safe? Or does that give them an opportunity to try to do this again with the relaxed 401? <clears throat> Transporting across you know, the lands for our natural resources yeah, this, are. Thanks, Sharon. Um, and, and Taylor touched on this in his comments about the zombie project of that coal plant, you know, coal mm -hmm. terminal down in the Columbia, lower Columbia. Mm -hmm. They just keep bringing them back, so they'll resubmit these projects. So it is it is a threat of these old projects coming to life again. Then we definitely need resolutions to stand together because they're asking about joining Earth Justice and maybe a little research to find out from our own uh, attorneys, et cetera, what can we do to be proactive rather than respond once they're applying for these permits and maybe sliding them in without us even knowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just got this up on there. Um, thanks, Terry and Joel, for getting it <clears throat> up on our our agenda. Um, <clears throat> because um, I think I want everybody to be aware of it and check with your uh, councils and your legal and technical teams to see if it's um, something you want to get in and um, uh, oppose. So um, you probably will be filtering up to your uh, respective agendas if it's not already on there now. So we'll probably, we'll probably be joining one. Well, we are actually, we decided yesterday to join. So just want to let, know, let others know that this threat is out there. And, uh, you know, it's open. There's an open door for polluters in the Trump administration. And, uh, you know, I, I think that I've been, I've been working with EPA and they've got this uh, new panel that they want on there. And I, I told them, I said, well, you know how... <laughs> Well, treaty rights protector, so they didn't seem to be <clears throat> too concerned about that. But I, I think there's a balance between like, I think right now, if it makes money, we don't care, permit it. You know, that's their basically their attitude. If it makes money, it's worth doing. And then on the other hand, we can't be saying there's going to be absolutely no growth, and we've never ever said that. And there's not going to be industries that are acceptable, you know, but some of these aren't acceptable to us because of their, their impacts on treaty rights. And so um, there's always somewhere in the middle that we need to land. Um, but we, this has gone so far um, out of the realm of reality. Um, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but it just seems to me that everybody who's got a, um, had a permit denied probably in the last five years is like ready to get it reissued. So um, just hang in there and uh, hopefully you'll um, take a look at this. Um, of Joel on the on, on next steps and just wondering if we can wait till um, July um, 1st on these um, you, are you feeling we can wait that long uh, yeah on on a, on the um, section 401 of the Clean Water Act um, we can wait on that one uh, on the executive order from Trump on the infrastructure project stream, we can wait on that. I think that that will still be okay. Um, the uh, waters of the U.S. rule, um, that's the one that, that uh, I think there'll be a decision, I think in the next couple of weeks, um, so before our at and on whether we want, tribes want to join a lawsuit uh, with their just, earth justice or go alone by themselves. Uh, so I think that one is going to require some, um, uh, some, some, huddling up within a fairly short period. So that, that's specifically on the waters of the US. Can we do an emergency resolution and pass it through the ATNI office to let tribes know and be aware of the specific issues in that one? So that they know what the options are, what's available to join or do on their own? Well, Joel, I was 
I was going to say, did we need a resolution. Do we got a resolution on the waters of the U.S.? I think we do, don't we? I think we do. Yeah, so I don't think there's any action the board needs to take as far as um, before July 1st, uh, because we have existing mm -hmm. resolutions on the on that. So, um, but we could get a, I think we can just get a letter out, um, uh, email blast out, Terry. Yes. To let people know, just give, basically give the same report that Joel just provided in writing. And uh, so people are aware of it. And a reference to the resolution that we've already yeah. you know, stood behind this. Yep. Yeah, I would send out the resolution in your letter as well. Yep. Good idea. Thank you. Yeah, we'll include it. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions for Joel? Good job, Joel. Yes, Mel? Yeah, I have one, um, Joel, or anybody else that might be able to answer. Uh, when, when you file a lawsuit, generally speaking, there are some legal bills. Would Earth Justice be supporting all the legal bills incurred when uh, something's filed? That, that was my understanding. I didn't ask them that direct question, but I, but I think they're, they're taking the lead, so they would cover the costs. But I'll, I'll, I, I will uh, confirm that. Thank you. Yeah, I, usually how it works, I, I don't know for sure, but usually how it works is you just team up with them and you know, you're paying your lawyer, of course, to be there. So they see that as a contribution. But usually they'll ask for, you know, they're not afraid to ask for donations because they are a nonprofit. So you might, you know, in your, in your charitable work, think of them as you're moving on. <clears throat> but usually you just get on their team. But if you get into a protracted legal battle, then the, the legal fees do mount. So it's a consideration when, when you put your foot forward it's yeah it's the the bills mount and also the not only do you have the bills it's the time that your lawyers are you are spending that was one thing that our one of our council members asked yesterday was that you have time to do this and they just kind of went well I, I guess but i think that's what you guys got to think about in analyzing the threat that this this uh, poses thank you Okay, if there are no other questions for Joel, we'll move on. Thanks so much, Joel. <clears throat> um, with us today, speaking to oppor opportunities in rural spectrum, the FCC rural tribal window is our friend Jeff Blackwell. Jeff chairs the uh, NCAI uh, telecom, uh, co chairs the telecom uh, subcommittee. So, uh, Jeff. Good morning, Chukuma uh, Hishche. It's a real honor to be back with you. I was on about a month ago when we were talking about a piece of legislation that was sponsored. Uh, it was COVID related legislation that was sponsored by the Native American Caucus in the House that we helped them with. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, that legislation was not included in the House latest package and it makes the opportunity I'm gonna talk about even more important. So I, I want to spend just a little bit of time encouraging you to apply for the spectrum that is currently available at the Federal Communications Commission at no cost for tribal nations. Uh, it, this is called the Rural Tribal Priority Window in 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. Now that's going to sound really complex. It's not actually at all. This is the most important telecommunications opportunity for tribal nations of the last three years. And it's gonna be very likely the most important infrastructure opportunity for you in the next three years. Essentially uh, what the FCC does is it licenses all of the frequencies upon which wireless communications are delivered. In this type of device or the type of device that I'm talking to you on um, and for 20 years, the great need in Indian country has been better telecommunication services. The term digital divide is actually almost 25 years old. Spectrum is the platform upon which a wireless network can be supplied. Uh, there are a number of these licenses that are available in the AT&I region. 
And at my last count this morning, there were only five AT&I tribes that have applied. Uh, I believe Warm Springs, Macaw, I think I saw that Crystal Hottaway was on the call here. Uh, Nez Perce uh, over at Coos and Umpqua and um, I believe Flathead, if Flathead is involved in, in the organization. Um, I'm gonna give you a couple of really important reasons why you should apply for this. First, it comes at no cost. Second, it is highly valuable. Spectrum, if the FCC has licensed Spectrum across the United States. It is owned by very wealthy corporations. We all know their names. Uh, it is licensed to these corporations. There are also a lot of national and international venture capitalists who have plowed into this field uh, and own Spectrum licenses. Um, your average reservation in the United States, or excuse me, the average number of licenses that exist above a, license, uh, a reservation in the United States is about 45 licenses. And one of the major challenges is, is to, to getting better wireless service and closing the digital divide is getting access to that spectrum. A lot of it right now is warehoused by companies. They're not building out. So for instance, in Washington state, there are licenses that cover a huge part of Western Washington state. But when those licenses were created, the companies that own them were able to build out to places like Seattle and Olympia, Tacoma, and meet their build out requirements. And they have very little interest in building out to places like Yakima. So another major reason why is that this spectrum is being provided to tribal nations at no cost. Once this tribal priority window closes, there are going to be corporations that are gonna purchase this spectrum. They're gonna win it at auction. If you don't get it, they will. Now, there are a couple of options that you can use this spectrum for. You don't necessarily have to run a network on it. This, a large part of this spectrum has been utilized by the Sprint Corporation. And there are a number of tribes who are planning to obtain these spectrum licenses and then turn right around and sublease it to Sprint. Uh, there, are, there are requirements for build out that come with FCC licenses, but in terms of the relative complexity of this opportunity to other FCC opportunities, this one's reasonably simple. This one's reasonably simple. Uh, so, I would say a very important reason for you to apply for this spectrum is to increase your access to capital. These licenses are actually bankable assets. They're leverageable. These licenses have been used for collateral and other, you know, in, in financing deals across the country. Another major opportunity here is for you to be able to grow your economy with a network at home. Um, 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. It's, old over the air tele uh, television spectrum. Uh, many of us are old enough to remember over the air television. Uh, and when TV went from black and white to color, uh, it's the kind of frequencies that at that point in time could carry technicolor, could carry stereophonic sound. It is pretty robust spectrum. It is not beachfront property, but it's certainly not the kind of stuff that that Indian country is consigned to right now. A lot of the types of spectrum that tribal uh, companies and tribal IT departments are running local networks on is the kind of spectrum that you use for your baby monitor or your garage door opener or uh, your, your old cordless phone at your house. This is the kind of spectrum that is, it's available at no cost at the FCC. There is affordable equipment to get a network up and running um, and I guess the most important part of it is uh, you're avoiding these, these upfront costs that every other entity in the United States has to pay for, except for tribal nations. Um, it, is, it is a type of licensing mechanism that we developed when, uh, when I was formerly working at the FCC, and it, it essentially creates the opportunity for a tribe to go in identify themselves to the Federal Communications Commission, fill out a pretty simple application, relatively simple application, and then obtain the license on a going forward basis. 
Um, this is an important opportunity for you to exercise your cyber sovereignty. And I will tell you, if you do not, somebody else is gonna own the spectrum over your reservation. In a technological world, that means somebody's gonna own a part of your reservation, the frequencies over it. So I strongly okay. encourage you to consider this. Uh, I wanna tell you Jeff, about a couple of, Jeff, yes sir. Jeff, um, this is not eligible to every tribe. Actually, it, there are, um, no, there are, there are areas that were previously licensed. This spectrum was initially licensed under the Kennedy administration. And it was made of, it's called educational broadband spectrum. It was made available to public universities to, uh, for, for educational over the air television broadcasting. So there's very little bit available in the major metropolitan area of Seattle and Tacoma, Olympia. Kitsap However, County, Kitsap County. Uh, Kitsap County, there's a large, there are large parts of it. The FCC actually has a, you know, in Indian country, we all love our maps, especially maps of our own homes. So the FCC has a website uh, where they make uh, the uh, information available. And there are three separate channels, meaning three separate areas of frequencies. And depending on which area, um, the map highlights, uh, it's kind of a color-coded map. Uh, the red in the map means that there's little to virtually no spectrum left. Orange, there's certain areas. And then depending on the coloration of yellow, uh, there can be uh, large amounts of the spectrum available. Um, I want to make an offer, uh, Mr. President. So um, at, at Amarind, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a business called Amarind Critical Infrastructure. And it, it works to help tribes um, develop their, their broadband deployment plans and does all sorts of things with tribes. Um, we were working with a number of our uh, existing clients to help them with 2.5 gigahertz. And uh, Congress asked the FCC to extend this window till next year. Right now, the window for applications closes on August 3rd. So, if you have not already considered this opportunity, you're behind the curve. You need to get on the need to get on the stick. Well, how difficult um, it is is it to, to apply? Uh, it's not that difficult at all, actually. It's a, kind of a two-step process. The first is filling out a form that identifies yourself and gives you gives the tribe or tribal entity a a um, FCC registration number, and then there is an application that basically walks through the uh, the the tribe or the tribal entity standing. Uh, and relationship to the land. The license areas are, are based on a map of tribal lands that's been put out by the FCC. The eligible entities are both tribal nations or their entities. Uh, tribal entities, there are tribal departments that have applied, there are tribal governments that have applied, there are tribal councils. Um, the, the, it's also, there's also an eligibility for consortiums of tribal nations. Um, that are 50, 51% uh, or more owned or controlled by tribes. What the FCC is, basically it'll take the spectrum that is available in that particular area, it will take it out of the auction process and license it directly to the tribe. The tribe receives a build out, um, an exclusive build out right that it can utilize itself or it can partner with somebody else or sublease to somebody else within two years um, 50 percent of the population needs to be covered and then within five years 80 percent and the tribe basically it's just timing for renewals in years forward there okay. are certain Jeff, 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 Jeff. Yes, hey, Jeff. Sir. hold on a sec um yes. we got things in the chat here for people oh good so uh james put that up so there's a link to the rural window and there's a link to amarind so if tribes want to analyze their opportunity they can contact Amarin? Uh, yeah, so Amarin has partnered with, uh, many of you may know my co-chair at, at NCAI, Matthew Rantanen. He runs a 600 mile, mile fiber wireless uh, network in Southern California. Uh, we've partnered with his organization, the Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association. And we've also partnered with Google, the American Indian Network at Google Gain. Uh, we've developed training materials. Uh, we've developed a, a okay. So a they can contact you if they have yeah. an opportunity. Right here is yes. Yes. Absolutely. My phone number in there, Jeff. 
Yeah, I can drop my phone number in there. Would you like me to try to show a map of the ATNI region on this? What's it, gonna, what's it gonna tell us? Well, it's gonna give you sort of a general idea of where there are things that are available. I can tell you there, there are large pieces of this that are available. Where there is not available 2.5 spectrum, however, we would love to work with you to try to find out for you what is available. Well, that's and true in my area, Jeff. I think, yeah, I think there are actually, actually where you are, Ron, I think there is spectrum available. It doesn't, I don't see any blockage on this map where Jamestown Sklalem is. I have a question. Um, yes. So my understanding is um, right now uh, at the Coeur d'Alene tribe that there are five licenses issued. And so there is n nothing available. However, if um, uh, at, I'm not sure of the deadline, but if it's determined that they are not building out and utilizing the spectrum, then it's use it or lose it. And then that, that um, what they have licensed to them, if they're not using it, it will be auctioned off. And so a tribe, if the tribe were to apply for that, they would be turned down and say, no, it's all um, been licensed out. But if, if it's, then it, if it's determined that um, it's not being utilized by one of those entities that then the tribe will be eligible to um, pick that portion up. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, there are elements of that are that are correct. I think if you are interested in obtaining spectrum, the first and best thing to do is to identify your tribe to the FCC and start building a relationship and working with the commission to look at licenses that are available that are coming available. Two point five is a specific area, but. Um, there are tribes that I know in the ATNI region that have worked with existing licensees to, to obtain spectrum. I mean, this is an open opportunity that it's no cost right now, and I can, I can go back over some of the basics. But um, the simple answer to what you're asking is yes. Yeah. And once again, this is, uh, you know, essentially a sovereignty issue. Uh, we're talking about um, the what's happening over the reservation. So that's excellent. Who's running the map? James. James, can you click on channel one? So if you come down here under urban areas on the layers, if you click on urban areas, those are urbanized areas where the spectrum is not available. There isn't a great deal of overlap except in the Seattle area. And actually, if you look even closer, you don't have to right now, but if you, if you were to look even closer, there are reservations that don't fall into these urbanized areas. They're, they're very close. But if you click turn off urbanized areas and go ahead and click on channel one, so there are three separate channels, which basically represent three separate areas of this spectrum. And I, I don't mean to get technical here, but there's three separate um, parts of it, parts of this spectrum opportunity. So you'll see that Seattle, you'll see up around Bellingham. If you actually click on Seattle, it'll tell you who the existing licensee is, that red. Cascade Public Media. I don't know, maybe that's a, maybe that's a derivative of a, of a state university or an, an educational entity. So go back and turn on channel two. And you'll see that that map doesn't change that much. And then turn on channel three. And you'll see, I think it's Umatilla that's covered in part by channel three. It's probably something out of Pendleton or the area. Um, Terry, to your point, the, Eastern, the western side of Coeur d'Alene has coverage that's clearly coming out of a university situation, probably in, in uh, Spokane. It's Gonzaga. Yeah, it's Gonzaga University. But these green reservations, those are the current applicants. There's a lot out there that has not been applied for. And, and they may be in progress. I don't know, but I would... I genuinely encourage you to take a hard look at this. Now, you may call me, you may call uh, Amarind Critical Infrastructure. 
I'm just gonna, this is so important. I wanna give you my mobile phone number and then I'll give you our main number here. But my mobile is my old one from DC. It's area code 202-253-4846. And uh, the main number here at Ameren, and they'll track us down, we're actually in essential business. So we're back sort of part time in a split schedule. The main number is area code 505-404-5000. And our offer is, in partnership with SCTCA and with Google, we would like to help you get your application filed pro bono. We'll provide this service to your tribal nation or your tribal entity pro bono. Uh, Irene Flannery is our director of Ameren Critical Infrastructure. Many of you know her from her time at the FCC. She and I actually worked on these rules back in the day. There are a lot of entities that are providing their time pro bono here. It's very important that we try to get as many tribes as are eligible into it. Separately, we also make the offer for the tribes, for instance, like, like yours, President Forsman, it, we would we'd be delighted to engage in a dialogue that would include you or sub, your subcommittee, your representatives from the tribes in the areas that don't have this 2.5 gigahertz spectrum of opportunity to try to figure out the process going forward like Terry was illustrating how to go about attacking the spectrum needs. Um, there's a lot of spectrum up there that has not been built out and there's growing pressure. It's growing among the tribes, it's growing on Capitol Hill. I actually put it into a rulemaking nine years ago for what Terry was talking about, a use it or lose it situation. If you're not gonna build out on tribal lands, let's figure out a way to get it to tribal governments who can either partner with others to build it out or build it out themselves. So this, again, this is called the Rural Tribal Priority Window at the FCC. <clears throat> the deadline is August 3rd. You want to be in the queue two weeks before that. There are more complexities. Some folks will not recognize everything on their map. There are certain tribes that are going to file waivers for off-reservation trust land or the inclusion of usual and custom areas uh, Jeff, where, Jeff, I'm sorry, is there a question? My question, Chairman Wooten from Samish here. Uh, is it just tied to reservation lands or is it trust lands or can you identify a service delivery area that you could tie it to? So there is a, a tie in the FCC's rules between trust lands and the FCC's definition of tribal lands. Then what the FCC has done is on top of that, they have carved out the more urbanized areas. We oppose that at National Congress of American Indians. We actually filed a petition for reconsideration. There may be a lawsuit coming on that one, I don't know. I heard the di discussion earlier about EPA and the pollution and lawsuits, and I agree with that, you know, that, that analysis. But uh, the FCC has a map that will show you exactly what it regards as your land with respect to uh, their definition of tribal lands. If you want to include other lands that are either held in trust or that are usual and customed or that you have a treaty right to, that is done through a waiver process that's filed at the same time. Uh, at Ameren, we've actually put together a, um, a, a template of what those documents should look like. Well, that, won't be, that won't be controversial. Uh, trust me, there's very little about telecommunications in any country that isn't that is not controversial. The water's fine. Jump in. at and I's been leading this for a while, um, but but a, um, if you do have questions that are specific in every one of those types of waivers and inquiries, I can take a look at the Samish map. Please give me a call. I'll be delighted to talk with you about it and how to move forward. All right. Thank you, Jeffrey. So uh, the email just got popped into the um, chat. So I'm going to send you what our IT person said to us and uh, maybe you can uh, give us some options and everybody else is welcome to uh, do that. Yeah. I'm, any I'm any other call, questions here? Go ahead. I'm going to call you too, Jeff. Uh, my, my guy, uh, my uh, guy who runs our IT and, and uh, internet didn't see value in it. I, I don't think he, I think he's missing something here. Uh, so I need to circle you and him back in my area. Um, it's it's something for nothing and it is an asset. I, I will tell you there are also excellent resources. It's mentioned in the chat. Uh, Danae Wilson, Crystal Hottaway, 
um, Susie Allen, um, uh, uh, um, Valerie Fasthorse. There are a number of uh, folks who have been committee chairs of your committee. We coordinate often. They're good resources as well. Uh, this is on the lips of everybody who works on telecommunications in Indian country. Um, please reach out and get involved at the very least. And, and please know, Ron, if you don't apply for it, somebody else is going to own it and they're going to own it over your reservation. Yeah. And, and then charge you for it. And then, yeah, of course. The, the implication there is then you have to go back and pay for something that you could have gotten for free. <laughs> well, I, I, I keep an eye on macaw out there. You got to watch those macaws, you know? <laughs> hey, I'm no longer a fed. That's an intertribal issue. <laughs> okay, in the chat box, uh, David Whitener is saying that Squaxin is in the process of completing the application, and there are issues in some areas where colleges or universities have gotten license over tribal areas. Um, and then Crystal uh, Hudaway is saying it is also very important to identify other organizations within your community or tribe who might apply for the license. If two entities are going after the same license, that triggers an auction and the two parties are prohibited from discussing it until the conclusion of the auction. So it is highly encouraged to speak with the tribal schools, colleges, and libraries that could potentially go after the same license. That is a very important point. The, the FCC can only allocate this directly to tribes if it is mutually, if it is an exclusive license. So if, for instance, one side of uh, Ron's tribe wanted to apply for it, another tribe's wanted, another part of the tribe wanted to apply for it, or if you have tribes that are very close to each other and overlapping, the FCC has, cannot process those and they have, you have to sort it out. One very important thing that I would support that's been said um, is making sure from a top down process, you know which entity, which organization within your tribal government structure is going to be the one applying. There are tribal governments, there are tribal colleges, there are tribal schools, there are tribal business departments, there are tribal media ownership holding entities that have applied for this. But it's very important to process that. And that goes into the, uh, the preparation for the application. So what, what's your email address? I'll put it in the uh, chat. Okay. Uh, actually, it's there. It's uh, G Blackwell at amarind.com. Amron's open for business. We, we went .com a couple of years ago. I hope you guys will uh, think of us in the insurance context as well. We do, my goodness, uh, we've been a longtime partner and support at and and we think the things you do are just wonderful. So it's an honor to be here. Happy to answer any more questions than I have. I'll take my leave, Terry. Okay. Um, this is Bill. Bill. Can I speak real quick, Terry? Go ahead, Bill. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, just um, uh, we have Amron uh, up at our housing unit. It's, uh, it's a HUD housing unit. It's very rural, uh, but it is not in trust. And so uh, we long um, talked about moving that land into trust, but we had priorities because we were working on our initial reservation. We just got that about four years ago now. So we, we probably could move the uh, HUD property into trust, but it's not. And so um, is that something that would be a factor in us moving on on this in the if you're familiar with the this central southwest washington south of chehalis yes i have been there sir i uh, would love to talk with you about it in the context of 2.5 2.5 gigahertz this proceeding will not get that land into trust but if you illustrate your relationship the there is a process that the fcc has opened the door to they haven't made any promises about the the waiver process but if you have a historical a governmental a services related uh, mission there it, it 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 makes for a compelling argument to to uh ask for that spectrum in a waiver well that's um, a good choice of words because that is the the site of the callous mission which was the first uh site of uh, basically center of religion in the northwest at one time 
Well, my mama used to put uh, land in a trust for tribal nations. So and she taught me about it when I was about 14 years old. So it'd be a lot of fun to work with you on that too. <laughs> but, but let me tell you, I, I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't say my old friend Terry Parr and I, we've already agreed that what we're going to do, we've already been coordinating on a webinar for, for, you, uh, for you as tribal leaders and for your designees in your tribal governments to participate. Um, we'll have um, Google and Southern California do that webinar with us and we'll walk through these sorts of questions and answers in greater detail. We're gonna try to pull that off very quickly too, so please watch in the next couple of weeks. Um, you can also access, access archived uh, presentations in two places, and, uh, and, and, and James, please help me put them in the, in the chat if you're on the chat right now. The first is there is a show that was on Native America Calling. They do a very good job of archiving their presentations. The second is for those of you who attended NAFOA and have access to NAFOA, uh, there was a panel that was done from the financial side of owning one of these licenses as well. And we'll cover that in our upcoming webinar with, uh, with at and I. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Crystal, um, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Hi, Terry. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to add a, a few quick things. Um, you don't, as Jeff was saying, that you, you don't necessarily have to be in a position to deploy. What you're doing is you're just setting up the pipe. Um, if you don't have an ISP or a WISP, which is a wireless internet service provider, um, you what you're essentially doing is setting up your pipe for water to be filled with. And so that's the whole point of this is to increase the infrastructure build out across the nation. Um, it, this is, uh, and you know, we, we all know infrastructure is crumbling. So um, the other thing is, is that the build out requirements. Um, so when you apply for the license, you're um, going to attach a shape file of your reservation boundaries in that um, you're agreeing that in three years, you're gonna be able to, to provide coverage, not service coverage to 50% of those people in the tribal lands. By year five, you're agreeing that you're going to be providing coverage to 80% or a point to point link, just one point to point link for every 25,000 people. So that's pretty much every single Northwest tribe. I mean, there might be some that are larger than 25,000, but essentially, all you need to do is, is build a point-to-point -point link that would provide coverage for 80% and you have met those year five requirements. Um, and as I had said in the chat, um, even if you don't need internet accessibility to um, go through this process to obtain the spectrum is well worth it. Um, the Nisqually, um, they are the ones who were the first to deploy 2.5 um, and that was in, back in 2014. Um, they don't necessarily need internet coverage or wireless because they're doing fiber to the home. However, they're still gonna be going after that license because that license has value. It's an asset as Jeff was saying. Um, yes, Ron, are, we are going after the license. In fact, I just filed my STA, my special temporary authority. Uh, we are going to be deploying a 2.5 internet um, service over the macaw. And in fact, as soon as I build, I'm gonna be, I, I will have achieved year five build out requirements. So, um, and every house, every single house on my reservation is gonna be able to get at least there where I am going to guarantee speeds of 25 meg download, three meg up. I could do more, but I don't want to, I don't want to follow CenturyLink's model over subscription, over saturation. So anyway, those are the um, two quick things that I wanted, or three quick things that I wanted to add on to Jeff's presentation. And um, I will go ahead and put my, um, my phone number in the chat as well. Um, and I do need to run off to another meeting, but I, I mean, if you have any questions for me or whatever, that's fine too, I'll take them. Hey, you know, Crystal, um, uh, uh, good to hear from you. Um, it, I, I love the technology as well. Uh, Crystal and I and folks that have been involved in this sort of stuff, we kind of geek out about what can be done with this uh, spectrum in terms of build out. Um, and there are a lot of options. There are, there are, 
there are options where depending on what's the spectrum available, you could put different government missions on it. One channel or area could be for public safety or law enforcement. Others could be for education, for economic development, or for residential services like she's talking about. But, but right now, quality is job number one. The, the, don't get lost yet in the types of networks that can be built. Get your hands on the licenses now before August 3rd. Then options will be bad. So I, I agree with everything you said, Crystal. I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned Nisqually. Um, Nisqually was actually one of the tribes that helped us. I was still at the FCC at the time that helped us prove that 2.5 was viable for tribal nations and that we needed to do something like this. Nobody imagined that it would ever take 10 years, but um, there's a lot of talent in the area that can help as well. Um, at and I has always been a, a, a rich region in terms of uh, telecom discourse. So I'm glad that you're you're stepping up again. Thank you. Yeah, I told you. Keep an eye on those macaws. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we need to move on. Um, we may need to re-engage uh, Terry before the deadline. And yes. I know one of the things that with the CARES Act money that's being distributed, um, internet investment is um, one of the top priorities um, for um, our communities. Like uh, I like to hear that houses are being hooked up because as we move forward, you know, we got to be prepared. And one of those is our students need to go to school and they may not be able to go to the buildings themselves. So they need access to high speed internet. I don't want to get going on that. We need to move off of IT and into the census. So, but I think we may need to re-engage on this. Thank you. Okay, one more comment, and that is, um, you know, it, he, Jeff says the deadline is August 3rd, but he said to, you know, try and get that in two weeks earlier. Um, that's just one month away, so just uh, heads up on that. But yes, let's get to um, the census. Um, uh, our friends Shana Radford and Elena Kapoman are with us today. Go ahead, uh, ladies. One, thank you for your time. Uh, I'm Elena Kapoman. I'm the Washington State Tribal Partnership Specialist, and we put together a little slide here for you showing response rates for reservation in the ATI area. Um, I included the information that we shared last week so you can see if there's been any increase in response rates. So, these are the number of households on reservation that have either gone online, which a majority of people have done, they've called this toll-free number, or they've mailed back the paper form they received. And I uh, really wanted to highlight Upper Skagit. They are the big shots for the week. They had an 8.6% increase over last week. And I'm really curious what they did, because that is amazing. <laughs> So if anybody is online or um, knows what they've been up to, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, Shana, do you want to share anything about um, Idaho and Oregon? Mm, maybe she Shana? can't. Do you have audio, Shana? Let me see if I can. I guess not. <laughs> okay. Uh, I shared in my weekly update that um, a new census video has come out. It's a playoff of the social distancing powwow. It shows a bunch of dancers and supermans talking in it. So if you haven't seen it, I'm happy to share that link with you or just go check out YouTube and type in social distancing powwow. Um, oops, I don't have a touch screen. <laughs> One thing that uh, Tribal Partnership in Washington is asking partners for are Wi-Fi hotspots. Maybe there are locations on the reservation or at Tribal Administration where citizens can go up and park and access the internet for free and do their census on their phone. Um, I know that there are several locations things like that. Like, unfortunately, libraries aren't open yet, but we were planning on being locations where people could come in to do their census. Um, many tribes have tribal partnerships, I'm sorry, not tribal partnerships. They have trusted messengers from not even fund in Washington, 
and they're able to answer any questions. Um, you have myself and Josh and Christina in Washington. You have Shana in Idaho, Oregon. You have um, Joshua Standing Horse in Northern California. You have Donna Bach in Alaska. So please reach out to us. I know you guys are got some other things to move on to. So that's really all the update I have. Just please get a hold of me if there's anything I can do to support your tribe uh, getting a better count in 2020 census. The enumerators are going to start going out and knocking on doors uh, around August 11th. So we have until then to self-respond before people start knocking on doors. If there's any questions? Any questions for Elena? Okay, thanks Elena. And I'm sorry, Shana, we couldn't uh, you know, access you today. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, I tried to unmute you, but. Uh, I'm on, I just, um, I was just on another call. Sorry about that. So, um, sounds like it's all covered. My apologies. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the numbers. Um, okay, um, other than that, Leonard, that's it. Okay, well, thanks everyone. And uh, appreciate all the great activities going on at and i And uh, just repeat the dates there for our conference, um, virtual June, conference there, Terry. June 30th, July 1st and 2nd. Okay, are those going to be half days or whole days, or do you have a feel for that yet? Um, uh, on the day one, uh, we will have a live morning, and this is this is all tentative right now, and uh, recorded afternoon. Tuesday will be all committee meetings, and then Wednesday will be a uh, the day three will be a in the a.m. There will be a tribal leaders discussion, and then when uh, day three afternoon will be um, resolution review and voting. Okay, so I, I have a quick question, Leonard. Uh, uh, I, I just I text uh, uh, Kevin Alice about the NCAI. So Terry, right now it's still on, or what's the story? I'm hearing two different stories. Um, so um, I'm hearing that uh, it will be virtual. However, I'm also hearing that the uh, the hotel and the convention center are giving NCAI um, uh, a, a hard time about getting out. Uh, so I'm not sure if they're going to try and um, modify that or not. But so I'm hearing two different things. Okay. I just, uh, Leonard, uh, 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 we got to keep a watchful eye on that. I'm, I'm assuming that's in your executive conversation. Um, and because we have not, uh, we've not been engaged with our fundraising nor the, uh, if it happens, any kind of cultural activities. Um, so, um, you know, uh, Sharon, uh, uh, um, Jeannie, et cetera, they were all coordinating that. I'm not sure how that's going to work, put it that way. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, Leonard, any comments? We've got, I'll make sure that gets on the agenda for our next call. Um, it was like you said, like Terry said, it was kind of like assumed that it was going to go virtual, but there was no formal action taken. And I think that's the reason I didn't do the formal action is because of the contract issue so i think they're holding their options open i think if they didn't have that contract issue they probably would have already announced it but they're a little um hesitant to announce so i'll get um i'll get more feet i'll get more uh, clarification in our next uh, call which is coming up all right all right thanks for, thanks for bringing that up okay with that i think we'll go ahead and adjourn and um look forward to seeing everybody again soon are we going to try again next week then terry yes okay good enough Oh, you all have a great, uh, great rest of the day. Right, Thanks, everybody. It's good to see all of you. Yeah. Right. Be <laughs> safe. See you, Bill.